Welcome back, everyone. We are at uh, uh, verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. And we have seen so far the work of God performed in Samaria, initially through Philip and later on by the apostles Peter and John. We've seen the response of the city as well, where people accepted what God was doing in their midst. Um, uh, we saw that the gospel impacted influential people like Simon and that there was great joy in the city. and Many uh, people turned to the Lord. And once this work was uh, done, Peter and John went back to Jerusalem, but they ministered to villages of Samaria along the way. And we you know, um, understood so many things uh, about the way to disciple people and uh, the, the uh, you know, the pattern of equipping people in the things of God. We've seen how uh, a church is emerging in the region of Samaria, even a community that uh, it was not uh, honored by the Jews of their times. So now coming to verse 26, we saw that this, this work of God, you know, began through Philip, uh, one of the uh, one of the the uh, volunteers with a good witness in the Church of Jerusalem. Uh, now, Philip's ministry continues in Acts chapter eight. Okay, so what kind of a ministry is this? So far, we've seen that his work was more evangelistic. Okay, evangelistic, but it included the supernatural. Let's see further. Verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert. So Philip is continuing to do what God wants him to do. How is God guiding Philip at this point in his journey? through an angel. So God guides us in many different ways, primarily through his word. But there are times that God may guide us in unusual ways, Okay, different, different ways. Maybe we see a signpost and we recognize, oh, wow, Holy Spirit is speaking to me. God is saying something or somebody speaks to us and we hear from God. So God can lead us in all these ways. But you see, God can also speak through an angel. So the word of God came to Philip through an angel. There is an instruction in this word. And it says, arise, go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he's getting directions from the Holy Spirit. So in prophetic ministry, we've, we've seen this. God speaks to our spirit and he gives us directions. So he's getting a route. This is desert. So there are uh, commentators who write uh, things like, uh, Philip had a um, celebrated ministry in Samaria. So when a minister of God has a wonderful ministry where people recognize, people talk about the work of that minister, it's very difficult to leave and go to another place. Okay, uh, But what is God calling Philip to do? Leave everything, Philip. Go to Gaza. This is desert. So you know, commentators, uh, some of them interpret and say that God is taking him from all the uh, acclaim and accomplishment to a dry place, a desert. But what is important for us as ministers, what is important for us as believers to go where God is leading, not to get caught up in what is happening, you know, in, in that place, our fame and our recognition, that's not what should keep us moving forward in the ministry. It should be the voice of the Lord, the purpose of God. In this situation, very funny, because God is taking Philip from all the fame to a desert land. What is Philip going to do? Verse 27, obedient. He's so obedient. So he arose. What did God say? Arise and go. 
verse 27 so he arose he did and it says so he arose and went so when we listen to the leading of god even if it doesn't make sense to our five senses god has a purpose god has a plan god has an open door in that path see what happens now that philip is obedient and behold a man of ethiopia eunuch of great authority under candace the queen of the ethiopians who had charge of all her treasury and had come to jerusalem to worship so god creates god appointments did philip know anything about this man of ethiopia nothing he only heard from the angel arise and go toward the south so the angel is giving him the location it's like google maps right it's like gps here is the pin go there how does the angel know god omniscient god knows where the people are who need to hear the gospel okay so god asks philip to go to a place where somebody needs to be ministered to so there was an open door where god had asked philip to go he arose and went and there was a man of ethiopia what is so special about this ethiopian man he was a eunuch of great authority sometimes the kingdoms of you know these times had eunuchs okay? so they had eunuchs who were uh, who were part of the um, you know the the king's team so they they were ministers in in the palace and so there were eunuchs in some of the kingdoms so here is another eunuch and what else is is special about this ethiopian eunuch he had great authority under the candace under candace the queen of the ethiopian so again an influential man in samaria a spiritual influential man now philip is able to minister to an influential person in the kingdom of ethiopia under the queen of the ethiopians okay so very influential what ability does this ethiopian have he had charge of all her treasury and had come to jerusalem to worship so here is a person you could say something like the finance minister of a country okay so it simply says has a uh, charge over all her treasury in other words he has the keys he can open the treasury oh is there a war okay this is the budget is there a famine this is the budget so he's a big person he has these incredible powers under the uh, queen of the ethiopians candace did philip know all these things zero he has no idea he's just following what god is telling him to do and sometimes our walk with the lord should be as simple as that we may not know the details all we need to know like abraham and like philip is go you just go okay? and god takes you to the right person so there is a divine connection that god himself is making in the situation was uh, one more beautiful thing about this eunuch okay he's influential he has authority it says he had come to jerusalem to worship so god fearing he was a god fearing person he came to jerusalem because he was seeking god he had a hungry heart before the lord what about simon in samaria we don't know whether he was seeking god but the word of the lord came to samaria he happened to hear it he believed his response was belief and he became a believer this is a different situation there is a man who is seeking god sometimes there are people they are looking for god they are asking the questions you know what is the purpose of my life 
you know who is who has created this world who has created me so they are seeking god you know, through all these questions so there are some people in that situation and look at the mercy of god god makes the connection he just tells philip i know where such people are i will take you just follow get up go down south to gaza so philip goes and there is a ethiopian eunuch who is also a worshipper a seeker of god and in the journey of this ethiopian eunuch verse 28 says he was returning and sitting in his chariot he was reading isaiah the prophet so it's like you know you think about oh finance minister of a country is uh, you know he has come to jerusalem he has worship maybe he has a mercedes or something like that he's just sitting in his car and uh, that's the point where you know god makes uh, philip and this ethiopian eunuch meet verse 29 then the spirit said to philip go near and overtake this chariot so we don't know maybe philip was on a two wheeler right so or in an auto rickshaw so he's just going okay god you told me go down south to gaza i'm going and here's the mercedes and he just feels in his spirit as he's driving the bike can you please go a little fast overtake go near and overtake the mercedes okay so something like that so just for us to imagine so he overtakes see sometimes the promptings of god in our heart no it might look very funny it might be very simple can you do and how much is god talking to him not one paragraph one book just one one line do this do that overtake go near and overtake this chariot but what is important in the prophetic you know we read about the prophetic obedience is the most important thing in the prophetic you hear from god you do it philip did it so philip ran to him isn't that beautiful everything god is telling he's doing it no wonder he's getting more instructions so he ran to him and when he went close to this mercedes you know he hears the man reading the prophet isaiah so maybe you know he just went near the chariot and loudly he can hear this man is reading from the uh, book of isaiah we know that the book of isaiah you know, was also something that the uh, devout people the devout jews you know, they used to study and read and honor uh, and to notice that this man is sitting in the chariot and reading from the book of isaiah also tells us that he is very wealthy because people of his times would not have had a copy you know today we have copy everywhere copy of the bible on the phone on the internet on your you know uh, ipad so copies are easily available but in the times when this eunuch was there the scribes had to write out a copy and an entire scroll would have been the book of isaiah so it's very expensive to get somebody to copy the book and you know carry the scroll but he's sitting in the chariot and he is reading the prophet isaiah so he had a copy so it tells us he was very wealthy this man was very wealthy and uh, when he is reading philip asks do you understand what you are reading so this is again you know about evangelism sometimes we have to take people from what they know to what they don't know the eunuch knew some passage in isaiah that's all he was reading but there was no understanding so philip makes use of that opportunity and says hey he asks a question you know asking a question is always a good way of leading people you know to uh, to seek god so he asks a question do you understand what you are reading so when you find a seeker instead of telling them many things maybe asking questions is very good make them think okay so what do you think the purpose of life is what do you think god created you for what do you think so he's asking a question do you understand what you are reading was 31 and he said how can i unless someone guides me 
and he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. So it's a divine connection. It's a divine moment that just the right question is asked, just the right response comes. So maybe this man, this Ethiopian eunuch, he was like the, um, you know, the ripe fruit on the tree. You know, when sometimes the ripe fruits, you just touch them, they just fall. And God knew that there is such a man who is ready to listen. And when we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, even in evangelism, look at the kind of evangelist that Philip is. He's following the leading of the Spirit. He's not just going, oh, I finished Samaria, let me go, you know, to Caesarea. No. Holy Spirit, where do you want me to go? So the leading of the Spirit, the Spirit shows him. There is a man, he's ready. He's asking questions. You go there, I'll tell you, this is the address. So he goes, he asks the question and immediately this man responds and he says, no, I don't understand. How will I understand if somebody will not explain, if someone doesn't guide me? So he tells Philip only, okay, looks like you probably know the answer. So come up and sit with me. So favor, how can an ordinary, you know, believer like Philip get an audience with the finance minister? supernatural favor it was just a moment of favor and he said come philip sit with me verse 32 the place in the scripture where he read was this so this is what the eunuch was reading he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent so he opened not his mouth in his humiliation his justice was taken away and who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth so this is what he was reading and this passage um, uh, you know it refers to isaiah 53 okay so that's what it refers to so some portions from there and isaiah 53 as you and i know uh, that is the passage that talks about jesus christ and how he is going to become a sacrifice and redeem us so as soon as this passage uh, you know philip saw that this is what he was reading um or Rather, in verse 34, we are told that he asks Philip a question. So he says, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? So it's a very good question that the uh, eunuch asks. So who is this passage talking about? So this was Philip's chance. It says, then Philip opened his mouth. Okay, so sometimes we have to wait by the leading of the spirit till people ask the right question. It says, then Philip opened his mouth. Then he answered. Okay, now is every technique of ministering to people, evangelism like this? No, there are times when you have to just go preach and that's the right thing to do. But in this situation, Philip had to wait. So the eunuch asked him, Tell me, who is this about? Who is this about? Who am I reading about? Uh, you know, is it some prophet? Is the is Isaiah talking about himself, or is this somebody else? That's when Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. So he explained and said, "Okay, come on, let me tell you." So this person who was led as a sheep to the slaughter was the Lord Jesus who uh, sacrificed his life for you. And so he goes on to explain and preaches Christ to uh, the eunuch. Verse 36, now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? So there is a little bit of information that kind of is not available in between. And that is to say that the eunuch became a believer immediately in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is why he is asking for baptism, isn't it? Philip told him, this passage is about Jesus. The eunuch believed. Next, verse 36. He's ready for baptism. Now, some people ask the question, when should I take water baptism? Should I take water baptism five years after I become a believer? Three months after I become a believer? You know, two weeks after I become a believer. When did the eunuch take baptism? Almost immediately. He heard, he believed, he desired to be water baptized. So he says, 
here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Verse 37. Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Okay. So what is the criteria for water baptism? When one believes in their heart, they can be water baptized. So then the eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, so he affirms his faith. He confirms his faith. He confesses his faith. And then, you know, the uh, uh, eunuch commands the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Okay, So very interesting things here. The baptism took place almost immediately. Where did it take place? Any water body which was seen close by. Who baptized? Not an apostle. Who is Philip? He's just a believer. Till now, Philip has not even been called an evangelist. Later, we will see in the book of Acts, that's where you will read about Philip the evangelist and his daughters. But now, who is Philip? Ordinary believer. Ordinary believer is baptizing another, maybe not that ordinary believer, I'll tell you why, but he's baptizing somebody who believed Jesus right then and there. Okay, so quite clear. Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, so what is so special about this Ethiopian eunuch? This was the first time as recorded in scripture that somebody, you know, that, that uh, the gospel is being taken to Africa. So Ethiopian eunuch, he came, he traveled out of Ethiopia and he came and the gospel, we are saying it because he is an influential person who can now go back and use his influence to share what he has learned about the Lord Jesus. So in that sense, the gospel went to Africa for the first time through the continent of Africa, through this Ethiopian eunuch. Did Philip know God's agenda, God's plan? Why is God telling me to go to MG Road? Why is God telling me you know, uh, to, to go to uh, some other place, St. George's Street or some other street? Sometimes we don't have the full picture. When Philip went to Gaza, he did not know that God's agenda was to take the gospel not to the next village or the town or the region or even a nation, but a continent, an entire continent. But what made it possible? Very simple, not complicated at all. Obedience. God said, arise and go. Philip arose. He went. Overtake the chariot, he overtook the chariot. God says something, just do it. That's all. Okay? And we will be amazed sometimes when we look back and see, oh, wow, I didn't know this was so and so, or I didn't know they could do this and that. We don't know. God knows. All that should matter to us is, God said it, I did it. That's all. And through the simple obedience, the doors for the gospel were opened up in an entire continent. Okay, so that is the beauty of Philip's journey here. Uh, and now let's see how God leads this man of obedience. Verse 39. Now, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Okay. So as Philip is being obedient to what God is saying, supernatural experience after supernatural experience for Philip, isn't it? Earlier, he's ministering with signs, wonders, where, where people are, you know, people received it. People received the miraculous. The entire city was rejoicing. Later on, what is the next supernatural experience? The angel said, he heard from an angel. What is the next supernatural experience? 
he heard from god a prophetic within his spirit he heard okay go overtake the chariot supernatural experience after that what happens he ministers to this eunuch and the spirit of the lord caught philip away supernatural transportation okay so you know you see this uh, like quite rarely in in the in the bible because it's so against the laws of nature that we know you know nobody just dis disappears you know i'm sitting here and i'm i've disappeared i've gone to the first year classroom but that's exactly what the scripture says about philip the spirit of the lord caught philip away meaning he just disappeared physically how do we know eunuch saw him no more supernatural transportation if you want to call it in a minute he's here next minute he's somewhere else can this happen today why not we don't see anything in scripture which says you know it has stopped or god has stopped doing the supernatural nothing in scripture tells us that so can people for you know the purposes of god get transported supernaturally why not so the eunuch saw him no more what is the impact of the gospel on the eunuch see in acts chapter 8 the the city of samaria received joy they were joyful the eunuch went on his way rejoicing so what does the gospel bring the true gospel when we preach it the genuine gospel when we preach it what will happen to people and the hearts of the people cities nations there will be joy there will be rejoicing because the salvation of jesus brings what liberty it brings restoration it brings um you know uh, peace and 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 everything that the cross has to offer so when the gospel is preached as those of us who are preaching let's remember when you are sharing christ with somebody they will be filled with joy because that is the result when you share the gospel in this passage we saw twice the samarian region samaritan region they rejoiced the eunuch went on his way rejoicing so that's what the gospel does for people that's what jesus does for people he brings joy into the lives of the people verse 40 but philip was found at azotis okay so um, we can also understand where was his pickup where was his drop so he was picked up from gaza he's dropped at azotis supernaturally and passing through he preached in all the cities till he came to caesarea so what was this did god just give him a vacation no he was on assignment he was on duty most of the times we see that the supernatural is manifesting as we are walking according to the purposes of god you know the supernatural is not for entertainment god simply doesn't do these things earlier also we saw an angel bringing the uh, apostles out of the prison but they were on assignment and they were told go back go back to the temple preach there they still went back and they were on assignment even now the supernatural experiences that philip is having it's because he's walking in the purposes of god not outside of that okay so we must not uh, try to use the supernatural for our own pleasure and our own whims and fancies that's that's not god's god's you know best uh, way for the supernatural okay so um quite a long journey there of philip uh and uh, some questions here let me take a pause and a breather for all of you and then we'll go to acts 9 uh, kennedy says why was this ethiopian eunuch castrated uh, so uh, kennedy i i am not too sure but historical reports tell us that uh, many of the ministers right in 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 some of these kingdoms they were castrated they they were made eunuchs they were made eunuchs because there was some 
policy, I guess, uh, in those times. I don't understand fully what that was, but this was a common practice. So if there was a, a, a skilled person, a trustworthy person, um, a high ranking official, sometimes the kings chose to make them eunuchs and have them, you know, in their uh, uh, in their team. Okay, so I don't know if I've answered your question, but yeah, that's the input I have. Okay, so any other um, comments, questions, anything before we proceed to Acts 9? Or any observations? Uh, mine, mine is about yes. Simon. Mine is about Simon. Now, now, you see what the Bible does not tell us whether Simon was forgiven because he he said, please for, ask the Lord so that I'm not punished. Is there any other church writing that he would be explaining about what followed next? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Charles. And as I said, uh, since we don't have it in scripture, I would look at everything else as you know, uh, speculation. Uh, moreover, you know, I haven't researched this. I don't know if I want to research it uh, in detail. Uh, so, yeah, maybe you could look it up, Charles, and you let us know. Would that be okay? Uh, I don't know even where to take over which <laughs> other writing, which is not canonical, because there are many. <laughs> yeah, true. Maybe I will try and see. Yes, mm. please. Yeah, just give it a shot and let us know what you find. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, Asayi, I saw your hand raised. Uh, anything you wanted to share? Can't hear you, Asayi. You're on mute. Oh, my apologies. Sorry. No problem. Um, Go ahead. This might be, this might be out of the scope of our uh, of our course, but I was just wondering. Um, we heard of Stephen, we heard of Philip, and just like you mentioned later, on, we're going to see that he's later called the evangelist. You know, um, my question is: <clears throat> Is it that? Because I've heard some preachers, or let me not say preachers, just some people who have commented on the fact that uh, seven people were appointed to be deacons. We only hear about just two people. Um, in your own opinion, or maybe based on historical facts outside of the Bible, I don't know, do you think um, these other ones were ineffective, they didn't have any impact, or do we just say that, you know, it's out of the fact that this is only what we know and Luke was privy to, on, um, to, to, to write in the sense that this was the only information he got about Philip and about Stephen. And for the rest, he had no personal contact or had no direct knowledge of what they had accomplished. So where would be your stand on that? Okay, thank you. Uh, say good question. And as I said earlier, my view is that uh, uh, Luke was very selective in what he put down. He has covered thirty years, three decades, the the birth and the growth of the early church in Jerusalem, and then it spread. So we will notice that uh, he is in a little bit of a hurry to cover the first ten years quite quickly so so far we've we've understood the birth of the church persecution rising uh, the church is growing uh, many believers are serving very well and it is spreading out to reach the nearby community so then quickly he will shift to our uh, main focus which is apostle paul i'm going to talk about apostle paul in acts 9 so he'll shift focus into the next 10 years uh, and then you know, quickly to the ministry of Apostle Paul, because as I told you, it's likely that Luke wrote the book of Acts as a defense brief. So he is selective, not that the other men and their ministry was not important, but Luke is in a hurry. He wants to quickly bring in 
Paul and his ministry. So maybe that is why they couldn't find place in the book of Acts, the other uh, volunteers and you know uh, believers in the church. Uh, the second reason is, uh, as, as I shared, you know, people mention about the, uh, the, the scroll uh, that uh, one couldn't write too much also because then the scroll would become very heavy. So uh, most of the gospels, uh, I mean, all the gospels, the epistles, the New Testament works, when you look at them, they're not very long. Okay, so they they have a sort of an average limited size, and one of the reasons people speculate is the size of the scrolls. They wanted to keep it short; they didn't want to make it too long. So I hope it somehow answers your question. Yes, yes, Pastor, it does. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Good, that's nice. Uh, anything else? Anything else attached to? Ma'am, can I just say a point? Yes, yes, sister, please. Uh, I believe uh, the whole scripture, whatever long or short is written, is written under the influence of the Holy Spirit God. And what all we have to know as a church is already revealed. We don't have to speculate or go into things which we don't know because they don't edify us in any way. It's, sometimes we, we there is a curiosity to know that is not wrong because we are human. But I think Bible is everything we need to know. That's just like First Chronicles 29, 29. All that we need to know, God has revealed. Thank you, ma'am. Just wanted to add that. Okay. Thank you, uh, sister. Thank you for sharing your view and opinion. Um, you know, regarding understanding uh, God's word. Uh, yes, uh, say just just a moment before uh, I, I let you share. Kennedy has a comment here. Can I talk about the black Jews in relation Queen of Sheba? If only the Ethiopian eunuch brought Christ Christianity to Africa. So Queen of Sheba is in the Old Testament, no, Kennedy. So we are talking about Jesus Christ and the gospel. So after the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, this is the uh, first reference that we have. Okay, so I'll um, move to Say. Please go ahead, Say. Yes, my apologies if I'm drawing, but um, bringing up this question or no, if no, you go ahead. had it. Um, was Luke a medical doctor in his time? Um, again, when we look at the book of Luke itself, the gospel, and then we look at the book of art, um, we see how meticulous he writes, detailed and all that. And it, can that be attributed to the fact that he was a medical doctor who wanted to be very detailed in his writing and all those? I just wanted to bring that up. So yes, uh, uh, say Luke is a medical doctor uh, and you know historians confirm that uh, about Luke and which also can explain to us why you know his writings are so systematic uh, and and so focused so yeah uh, anything anything else you were looking for no, not at all just a confirmation basically I, I, yeah just you know it's, it's, I, I just I'd like to have all this background it helps appreciate the bible more and the writings you know that i just wanted to bring up thank you i understand yes definitely so yes uh luke is a medical doctor okay so uh we we know that as a fact all right uh so if we don't have any more comments i will move on to acts chapter 9 another very beautiful um chapter every you know you could just stay stuck on uh, the book of acts for a, for a year or i don't know how how long but uh, we're just trying our best to you know keep moving forward mm. 
Okay, Asha has shared uh, my learning of this chapter eight is that obedience is what is required from us. Good obedience is most important in prophetic ministry and also is good to ask questions. Okay, and Kung shares, for me, I liked how you mentioned that obedience is important when we are in ministry. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts, uh, Asha and Kung. Okay, so let's uh, move forward to Acts chapter nine. And let's see what's happening here. But before that, I wanted to project for us uh, the journey of Philip. Okay. It's always good to see a picture from time to time. Hope you are able to see everyone. Okay, wonderful. So here you have the you know the Samaritan uh, region, Samaria, uh, and then from Samaria, I don't know if you can see, but the road to Gaza. Okay, uh, and from here he um, moves to Azotis. Okay, so he's picked up supernaturally. He goes from here to Azotus. In a moment, he appears in Azotus. And uh, uh, after Azotus, we learn that he continued to preach about Christ and he went all the way to Caesarea. So this is the journey which uh, Philip made. Okay, so Philip made. So, and we can see here Jerusalem, Jerusalem uh, in this region. Uh, so, from Jerusalem, Peter and John would have gone all the way to Samaria, uh, ministered to the people there, and then came back to Jerusalem. So, Jerusalem is like your uh, base church or mother church or you know whatever term you want to use it. So, the apostles are functioning from here, the headquarters, and the work is beginning to take place in the uh, nearby regions as of now. So this is what Acts 1.8 said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then we will see uh, how through Apostle Paul, the ends of the earth is you know, where the gospel will begin to move towards. So uh, a little bit um, for us to sort of lock in all that we have learned so far. So coming back here to Acts chapter 9. Okay, much to uh, share. Uh, again, a very, very beautiful uh, passage. Then Saul, we talked about Saul in the beginning of Acts chapter 8. And we saw how he was so passionate about persecuting the believers. Again, it talks of his passion. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. So it just shows to us that he was very proactive in his ministry at that time. What was his ministry? I must persecute people who believe in Jesus. That was his ministry when he was not a believer. So proactively, zealously, he goes to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So what does he do? He uh, uh, wants to keep traveling you know, and moving about many kilometers, persecuting those who believed in Jesus. So even the synagogues of Damascus, which are a little further, you know, they are further away from Jerusalem, Saul is moving up to that region. He's taking the official letters necessary to keep persecuting. and. You know, the uh, verse 2 says, so that if he found any who were off the way. So the way is the earliest term that was used to describe the believers of the Lord Jesus. So there's no term like church that you see so far. The term which is used for believers of Jesus is the way. So they were known as the people of the way. Uh, so he is persecuting these people, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he wants to catch them. He wants to tie them up, bring them back to Jerusalem as his trophy. So that is the work that he is, uh, uh, you know, passionately doing. Now, verse three, 
okay so before i go any further you know scriptures tell us in galatians paul admits uh, i'll just see if i have uh, which passage yeah galatians 1 verses 13 and 14 where uh, paul says about himself for you have heard of my former conduct in judaism how i persecuted the church of god beyond measure and destroy and destroy it and i advanced in judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers so nkjv version galatians 1 verses 13 and 14 so paul himself admits that why he did what he did was because he thought he was serving god so in judaism zealously he's trying to serve god he's trying to preserve the culture and the faith uh, of of uh, judaism and uh, so you see the personality of paul as an unbeliever he's passionate as a believer also he is passionate so sometimes god uses our natural personality also okay all of us are different and you would see you know different other people barnabas has a completely different personality god uses his personality paul's personality a passionate man and it's the same whether he's on you know one side of the fence or the other now verse 3 now he has deliberately taken permission he's moving towards damascus to catch these people who believe in jesus bring them bound to jerusalem so he's on his journey assignment and we are told as he journeyed he came near damascus so he's reaching quite close to damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So a persecutor is on his way to do what he wants to do. And God interrupts him. Scripture says, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And later on when paul explains himself you know we we, we will see this in acts i think 26 we'll see there when he narrates the story he will tell us that this was noonday and those uh, 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 of uh, the people who have been to these regions you know the judean region and all you know that the afternoon in the these regions is so bright the Middle Eastern sun, people talk about it. And noonday sun must be super bright. But what is Paul saying? Suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. So we register it this way. A light brighter than the sunlight. Noonday Mediterranean sunlight. Now, I don't know what kind of light that was. But obviously, it was too bright. For him to take so he fell to the ground why did he fall to the ground normal reaction he's afraid he's afraid he sees a light so bright in the afternoon that he just falls maybe to protect himself he fell to the ground and it also says he heard a voice saying to him so god is speaking personally to a persecutor calling him by name Saul Saul whenever you see a repetition of a name like this when Jesus says this or the scripture says Martha Martha Jerusalem Jerusalem it's a lot of emotion there twice God is repeating that name Saul Saul and notice what he's saying you remember what happened when uh, Stephen saw the heavens open Jesus was standing Okay, standing ovation for somebody who fought the good fight of faith. Now, we will see. I'm just saying, using the word God. But later, you know, he, uh, he the voice will introduce himself as Jesus. But Jesus tells Saul, all these people you're persecuting from Jerusalem to Damascus, he just sums it up and he says, why are you persecuting me? So. When people are persecuted, when believers are persecuted, Jesus takes it personally. 
okay so at on this note i'm going to stop it's really like you know heart uh, touching and warming so we'll get deeper into this in the next class uh let's pray and close off i invite anyone to please pray then i will uh, close this class Could somebody please step up and pray, please? Dear God, thank you so much for this day, Lord. Thank you for helping us to learn about um, the book of Acts, chapter 8, God, that, Lord, that we may be more obedient and help us to understand the depths of uh, who you are and what you're doing, Lord, that we'll be God-fearing person. And also, Lord, that may we uh, spread the joy among the cities and all the places, God. Thank you so much, Lord. I pray. Your blessing over my classmates and my teacher, Pastor Nancy Lord, thank you for everything you need me pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Asha. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, God bless you. Meet you again in the next class. Bye for now. Thank you, Pastor.